Now, many of you told me how much you enjoyed our interview earlier this week with Professor John Christie. I've had countless emails from people wanting to hear more about the science of climate change, especially after our interview with Professor John Christie recently. And as a result, I have on the line one of the most esteemed climate scientists in the world. His name is Professor Richard Lindzen. He's been described by Professor Tim Flannery as extremely creditable, one of the reputable scientists around the world, a distinguished scientist in his field. And he's a has a string of qualifications, awards and appointments to his name. He's specialised in atmospheric tides and ozone photochemistry. He's published over 200 scientific papers, and importantly, Professor Lindzen was a lead author in the IPCC Third Assessment Report on Climate Change. Now, recently, he made a presentation about global warming and how to approach the science. It was presented in Tel Aviv. He made some key points. At the heart of his presentation was an uneasiness about widely used terms such as global warming and climate change. You see, Professor Lindzen is a true scientist and questions why scientific definitions of these basic terms haven't yet been formulated. In simple terms, he asks, what do terms like this mean? And he goes further, being highly critical of cliches such as settled science and so on. He says that much of this is alarmist, and when you wade through all of this to the basic science, the changes we are all panicking about are quite small. Professor Lindzen's at odds with a speech made by our Prime Minister Julia Gillard in Adelaide a fortnight ago, and you'll recall that, it was the Dunstan lecture. She said every credible scientist believes in climate change. She presented her case with a sense of urgency and panic, saying we had to act now. She used this as the justification for her carbon dioxide tax and the reason to go back on a core election promise. Professor Richard Lindzen, welcome to the program. Thank you. Glad to be with you. It's very interesting. We came across you because after the Prime Minister said that every reputable scientist agreed that man was warming the planet and we had to act now, our own professor, our own climate commissioner, Tim Flannery, said that Professor Richard Lindzen was indeed a reputable scientist, but didn't uh, concur with what he was advocating, that is, immediate change and a carbon tax in this country. So we've found the reputable scientist that seems to fly in the face of what the Prime Minister is saying. What are your thoughts on what our Prime Minister has asserted there? Well, she's, you know, played what I refer to as a uh, bait and switch. There are some things that scientists, for the most part, agree on, I mean, there's not too much disagreement that there has been a very small increase in temperature. And by temperature, what one usually refers to is something called the global mean temperature anomaly. You don't average temperatures over the globe. You average the changes from their mean values somehow defined. Um, and this is pretty tiny. It's a fraction of a degree. And there's also a lot of agreement that uh, the increase in CO2, which has been measured, should contribute something to this. Uh, none of that is alarming. OK, let's go back a little bit. Um, so, therefore, you say scientists agree that there is a slight warming of the planet and that man contributes to that because of CO2 output. But let's quantify yeah. that. Let's quantify that. Okay, if nothing else changed, adding the amount of CO2 that we've added thus far should account for maybe a quarter of what we've seen. Uh, we've added some other greenhouse gases, methane, fluorocarbons, freon, this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And that should bring one to perhaps half a degree uh, if we doubled CO2, it's well accepted that you should get about one degree warming if nothing else happened. One degree warming over how long a period? Well, it depends on how long it would take to double the CO2. And that we don't know. That depends on the technology, the economy, and so on. But one degree is reckoned as not very significant. The question then is, 
is what we've seen so far suggesting that you have uh, more than that? And the answer is no. In fact, the models do say you should have seen two to five times more than you've already seen. You know, you have to then accept, if you believe the models, that uh, you actually should have gotten far more warming than you've seen, but some mysterious process has cancelled part of it. But hold on a second. We've had politicians and so-called scientists in this country alarming us and making us feel guilty about our CO2 output and saying we must act now because sometimes it'll take 1,000 years for CO2 to break down, and saying we need a carbon tax right away, we can't even wait for an election for this. So are these alarmist steps that they oh, have sure. taken? sure. I mean, these people are being grotesquely dishonest. I mean, I think even Flannery acknowledged that Australia doing this would have no discernible impact for virtually a millennium, even if uh, Australia's output during that millennium was increasing exponentially. Uh, Australia to act now is, you know, a bit bizarre and and certainly uh, cannot be justified by any impact it would have on Australia or anyone. C can I just get you to repeat that, uh, Professor? So for Australia to act now, it is foolish? Oh, Sure. I mean, it, it's a heavy cost for no benefit. And it's no benefit for you. It's no benefit for your children. No benefit for your grandchildren. No benefit for your great, 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 great grandchildren. I mean, what's the point of that? For Australia to affect world temperatures on its own, because there is an argument that we need to go down this path on our own, we will make no difference to Absolutely. global warming. The evidence is pretty good that uh, even if everyone did it in the whole world, it wouldn't make a lot of difference. What difference would it make if everyone went along and stopped the production of CO2 at the moment? Well, it would be a moral disaster because it would mean that uh, much of the world would preclude development and so they'd be more vulnerable to the disasters that occur regardless of man. I mean, you know earthquakes, uh, tsunamis, uh, droughts, uh, all these things occur naturally. And one's vulnerability to this uh, decreases as your wealth decreases, or your vulnerability increases as your wealth decreases. So if the world went along down the path of stopping the emission of CO2 tomorrow, uh, what benefit would that make to the world? Our Tim Flannery says it would take a thousand years for any change at all. Again, it, the crucial thing is sensitivity. Uh, what do you expect a doubling of CO2 to do? If it's only a degree, then you could go through at least two doublings and probably exhaust much of your fossil fuel uh, before you would do anything that would bother anyone. So why are we being inundated with the guilt trip? Why are we being told by our own Prime Minister here that we need to act now and we can't wait, we've got to save uh, the planet for future generations? Uh, how would you describe words like that from our Prime Minister? Well, I think either it's uh, ignorance or cynicism. I mean, you know, I understand that your Prime Minister is, you know... In, heading a minority government and depends on the Greens for her coalition, uh, you know, for them it's a power trip. It's a fear campaign too, would you agree? Well, you know, fear is, is a mechanism for prompting people to do things that are irrational. We keep getting told the polar caps are melting. What's the true evidence connected to that? None. And, you know, it's again an issue of defining what you're talking about. Uh, in the North Pole, you, you don't have a cap, you have sea ice. That's very variable. And as far as Greenland and uh, Antarctica go, uh, there's no evidence of any significant change. I mean, you know, again, your measurements aren't that great, but uh, any reports you hear are, again, focusing on tiny changes that would have no implication. If you look at a certain time period, you might have hit two warmings and one cooling, and so the net is a warming, but it's, you know, no different from flipping a coin three times. You're going to get two heads or two tails. <laughs> That's very good.
you'd be very good at a game we play in Australia called Two Up, I think. Um, now, <laughs> let's, can I ask you about carbon dioxide and how it differentiates itself from carbon? Quite often, the media here in Australia like to talk about carbon taxes and the impact it's having on the warming of the planet by showing wonderful pictures of dark plumes of smoke coming out of coal-fired power stations. This is not necessarily the CO2 that warms the planet, right, on its own. CO2 is invisible. If you have dark smoke coming out of a smokestack, you really need a, a, a scrubber. I mean, you know, you're getting soot out of it and so on. You're not burning very well. If you burnt completely, you wouldn't have any of that junk. You'd just have clear CO2. Yes. What do you think we'll be saying in 40 years' time uh, and looking back at this period of alarm? Oh, I think it'll definitely fall into, you know, the category of popular delusions. People will look and wonder at this age and wonder how science broke down. And in a period of technological advance, that the public could be swayed by arguments uh, that make no sense and get hysterical over it. But it's hard for normal lay people like ourselves to believe that scientists in the world could be prone to hysterics, but you're saying that that's the case. Well, you know, you have to remember this is an issue where what most scientists agree on has nothing to do with the alarm. I think uh, the real problem is so many scientists have gone along with it without pointing out that what is established reasonably well uh, has nothing to do with uh, the urgency that's being promoted, which is largely a political matter. For a lot of people, it's also something I call the quest for cheap virtue. You know, people need a cause. Yes. And uh, they sort of feel puffed up by having a cause like saving the earth. And uh, they don't really care that they're hurting people, that they may be involved in an immoral cause and so on. They're perfectly happy to just go along with it because they were told it's virtuous. I think you have just nailed the one, number one reason for the alarm in the world, and in particular right here in Australia, where people would like to be seen as noble and saving the planet and that is ego-driven, uh, not science-driven. I thank you so much for your time. Thank you for okay, making... Okay, well, listen, good luck. I hope you're spared the, the policies that are being proposed. Well, we can only protest and uh, try and put the facts on the table for people. Professor, okay, thank you very much for luck. the time. Okay. Bye-bye. Richard Linsden is his name, a professor that even Tim Flannery regards as reputable. And it goes back to this, climate is never static. It never has been static. And Professor John Christie spoke to us about that last week. He said that global surface temperatures have risen 0.7 of a degree Celsius in the past 100 years. That CO2 in the atmosphere is increasing at around 0.5% per year. As Richard Linsden just said, there is no significant change. And we will look back... He's sure on this time as the delusional age, an age of hysteria without sense. And I think we need to confront the constant politically motivated and public rhetoric that we're hearing on a daily basis with the truth. And we'll continue to do that on the program. 131-873, it's 22 to 2. Chris Smith across Australia.